All right, we're ready to go. Okay, perfect. Okay. I call this virtual meeting of the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement to Order. Members, it's Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. And I'm gonna read this because this is in accordance with the LCC requirements. This uh, meeting is being held with the memo dated April 21st, 2020 from the LCC chair and vice chair regarding commission meetings being held remotely. You may have been uh, already seen or heard about these procedures or participated in them. In them. These are for mostly our testifiers. However, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with them, number one, members should be muted when not speaking. And number two, use the raise hand feature if you wish to speak and click lower hand when finished. The materials for today's meetings are available by clicking on today's date on the legislature's combined calendar and scrolling down to the Pension Commission agenda. Testifiers, if you would please remember to keep your testimony to three minutes, and if you could, please turn your audio and video off be uh, before you become testifying. That keeps all the senators and representatives up to the top of this Zoom. The um, Ms. Ms. Diesland, would you please take the attendance? Chair Rosen. Aye. Or here. Senator Frentz, present, yes. Present. Senator Frentz. Here. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Jasinski. Present. Senator Pappas. Present. Senator Rarick. Present. Senator Senjum. Representative Berg. Present. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Herr. Present. Representative Murphy. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative O'Driscoll. Yep. O'Driscoll, present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, present. Senator Senjum. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Great, we do have a quorum for the record. Can we are, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the meeting minutes from March 2nd, 2021. <clears throat> and members, those, that is in your packets. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I would make a motion to approve the March 2nd, 2021 meeting minutes. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion prevails. The amendment, the minutes are adopted. I will slow down for the members on the turning your video off and on and all that good stuff. We have um, two, about four more. We have about six items on the agenda and we're hoping to get to the sixth one tonight. But right now we have um, House File 1107, Representative Murphy's Para Statewide Volunteer Firefighter Plan. It permits the allocation of fire state aid between the SVF plan and the municipality. And Mr. Burkett, could you please review the bill? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. House file 1107 is the second of two bills recommended by the 2018 report of the fire state aid working group. The first bill was included in the 2020 pension omnibus bill and applied to combination departments covered by a fire relief association. Unlike last year's bill, House File 1107 applies to combination departments in existence on January 1, 2021 that are covered by the statewide volunteer firefighter plan administered by PARA. A combination department is a department that has both career firefighters that are covered by the PARA police and fire plan and also volunteer firefighters covered by the statewide volunteer firefighter plan. Under the bill, these combination departments will be able to split or allocate fire state aid between the two groups of firefighters to pay for retirement benefits. Under current law, combination departments covered by the statewide plan can only use fire state aid for volunteer firefighters, um, but not for career firefighters. The language in this bill was developed based on the 2018 report of the Fire State Aid Working Group and also input from an informal working group formed by the commission during the 2020 um, session uh, interim and the recommendation of Paris Statewide Volunteer Firefighters Plan Advisory Board, uh, which also made a recommendation on this issue. Um, I'll briefly go through the section by section 
summary and then draw your attention to a few points of analysis that are in the staff summary. House file 1107 permits combination departments covered by the statewide plan to allocate fire state aid. And if the department or association files a plan to allocate fire state aid with para and para approves a plan and the <clears throat> um, volunteer firefighters employed by the municipality do not file a petition with para to stop allocation of the fire, of fire state aid. The bill's in two sections. Section one amends existing statute to allow the allocation under a new proposed section. And section two contains the new proposed section, which is 477B.041, and which is divided into eight subdivisions. Subdivision one provides combination, provides definitions. There are two substantive definitions. The first is for combination department, um, which provides that a municipality or independent nonprofit firefighting corporation, which in, during the previous calendar year employed at least one career firefighter and at least one volunteer firefighter, and that this must have also been true on January 1 of 2021. Um, and it provides a definition for covered period. Um, and the definition provides that it cannot exceed a duration of three years. And that's the aid allocation plan, cannot exceed a duration of longer than three years. Subdivision two permits a combination department to submit an aid allocation plan if the plan is approved by the department's governing body. And the plan specifies that the amount will be transmitted to the combination department and the plan specifies the duration of the plan. And the plan includes the date that the notice was provided to the firefighters. Under subdivision three, uh, PARA is required to approve the aid allocation plan if the requirements in subdivision two are met. And in, if within 45 days of receiving the plan, PARA does not also receive a petition to stop aid allocation. Subdivision four directs PARA on how to deposit fire state aid if a plan is approved. Uh, it applies to four limits that could cause the amount to be lower than the amount that's in the plan. Those four limits are that a combination department cannot allocate fire state aid to career firefighters if more fire state aid than is contributed in employer contributions for career firefighters during the previous year. Sorry, it cannot, um, it cannot allocate fire state aid to career firefighters in an amount that's more than fire state aid um, that was contributed to employer contributions during the previous calendar year. And it cannot um, allocate more fire state aid than the amount of fire state aid that PARA receives in a given year for that municipality or more than the fire state aid left over from the municipality's funding requirement is met for that year. And finally, in order to allocate fire state aid, a combination department's account with the statewide plan must be at least 100% funded and the amount allocated to career firefighters cannot cause the account to become less than 100% funded. Uh, these limitations um, protect the plan funding. Uh, moving on to subdivision five. Subdivision five permits municipalities to modify or terminate an aid allocation plan. Subdivision six, um, this is where the bill sets forth the um, petition to stop aid allocation process. And that petition must be to submitted to PARA <clears throat> on PARA's form within 45 days after the municipality submits its aid allocation plan to PARA. The petition um, that contains a majority of the names and signatures of the volunteer firefighters must be gra granted by PARA in which case the fire state aid continues to be paid to the combination department's volunteer firefighters and it does not go to the career firefighters. Under subdivision seven, uh, subdivision seven requires a municipality to notify firefighters 30 days before it submits an aid allocation plan to PARA. And finally, subdivision eight authorizes and requires PARA to prescribe forms for the administration of uh, this new section. Both the sections are effective for aids payable in 2022. And there's a few points of analysis in the staff memo I would draw the commission's attention to. On page five in the memo is a list of the 18 municipalities that are affected by this bill. It includes uh, important information about each of these accounts for the statewide plan. And again, I'll just point out that this is a pilot program or an effect a pilot program uh, because it applies to existing combination departments as of January 1, 2021. Uh, new departments would need additional legislation um, if they wish to use this section. Um, it's not clear what amount of fire state aid for each uh, department would be available to be used, 
Uh, but a you can get a rough idea from the column labeled annual excess FSA in the staff summary. And you can see the amounts vary from about 313,000 per year um, down to 5,471. And then finally, I'll just address why this bill is different from the bill that passed last year. Again, that bill applied to relief associations and allowed them to negotiate an agreement with the municipality that was mutually beneficial for both the, the relief association and the municipality. Um, since many of these 18 municipalities covered by this bill were not affiliated with a relief association, uh, the agreement model does not work for, those, for these 18 municipalities. And thus this bill adopts a first volunteer and then career approach uh, to fire state aid distributions, meaning that the volunteer firefighters get the fire state aid first. And then if there's excess fire state aid, it can be used by the career firefighters. Um, and it also uses a different mechanism for firefighters to have input on, on how or how much fire state aid can be used. And that's that, um, and that's that um, petition to stop fire state aid, which would allow the volunteer firefighters um, to keep the, uh, the municipality from from allocating fire state aid. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Murphy, that's the uh, summary of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Burkett. Any questions before we go to testifiers? Great summary, thank you very much. Mr. Anderson, please identify yourself for the record. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Doug Anderson, Executive Director for PARA. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Commission members. I um, want to thank Representative Murphy for her work on this bill, as well as Senator Howe. I also want to thank um, uh, Susan Lancheski and Chad Burkett for um, a lot of work. This was a hard one, I think, over the, the summer. Uh, <clears throat> and then I want to thank our SBF Advisory Board. The uh, PARA Board relies heavily on the SBF Advisory Board for all issues related to the statewide volunteer fire program. Uh, the Advisory Board consists of 10 members. Five are uh, volunteer firefighters. One represents townships, one represents cities, one member represents fire chiefs, and one uh, member represents the office of the state auditor. And these 10 members of the advisory board are appointed by different entities. Um, they're appointed by the Minnesota State Fire Chiefs Association, the Minnesota State Fire Departments Association, the Minnesota Association of Townships, and the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, this group met three times this summer, uh, fall, uh, September, October, November. Uh, they discussed the proposal from the LCPR working group, made a few modifications and uh, reached an accord. Uh, we believe, PARA believes that the proposed legislation is consistent with what the advisory board found acceptable. Uh, the bill does outline some uh, para administrative duties, which we're uh, happy to accept and confident that we can help uh, meet those obligations uh, and help inform firefighters to make a good decision. Uh, with that, I thank you for uh, your time and be happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I think we'll go through all of our testifiers and then if there's any questions for all of you, we'll handle it that way. Next testifier is Neil Zickman who is the Mounds View City Administrator. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Niall Zickman, Mounds View City Administrator, but tonight I'm also representing our joint power agreement cities that include Blaine and the city of Spring Lake Park. And I'll just mention I was the former chief at Spring Lake Park, Blaine, Mounds View Fire for 21 years. Testifying in support of the legislation. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing the bill. Uh, chief authors, uh, Representative Murphy and Senator Howe, the Pension Commission staff, uh, you know, um, Executive Director Anderson mentioned them. They, they played a significant role along with that advisory committee, but then Doug Anderson and his governmental uh, person, Amy Strange, for their efforts in bringing this forward so those of us in the state plan could benefit the aid apportionment, the, the same as locally administered plan. So I've been involved in volunteer and PNF pension since 1992. So again, I'm going to close with my support. I, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't just highlight, uh, Mr. Burkett did highlight, you know, that this created a pilot. Uh, you know, and there's no plans looming that are coming in, but you know, perhaps uh, Mr. Anderson and his group can, you know, look at, you know, the wisdom of that. Everybody in the state will be allowed to do this until they change. And then they presumably come back with the exact same legislation you're, you're discussing tonight. So 
with that, I'll close my uh, remarks. And again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zickman. And the last testifier is Mr. Mark Rosenblum from the president of the Minnesota State Fire Department Association. Welcome, Mr. Rosenblum. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I'm Mark Rosenblum, president of the State Fire Department Association and member of the statewide volunteer fire plan board. Uh, back in 2009, Para was good enough to take on the responsibility of managing the statewide volunteer firefighter plan um, for free uh, fire for fire relief associations um, and free them from the burdens associated with submitting their oversight paperwork to the state auditor. Um, over the last six to eight years, fire chiefs, uh, mostly in metro departments, have found themselves trying to solve fire response service model challenges in their communities. And one of the solutions that they found is to eliminate the paid on call volunteer firefighter role, replace them with full or part-time or para employees, which in turn eliminates the need for a fire relief association and subsequent pension plan. Um, along with this change, fire and city leaders started looking to find monies to help cover the large increase in para contributions that came from that and one of those options is to change this legislation and make state, state fire aid available to the city or department to cover those costs since it no longer needs to, ear, the, needs to be earmarked for the volunteer or, or paid on call pension plan. The model and language presented here is it, uh, it covers only the 18 statewide um, uh, volunteer fire plans who are looking to do just this the pilot group and with the potential for other pension plans to be added in the future. Um, a couple of thoughts and concerns that I have are as follows. Um, so although this language is modeled after the 2020 language, that language was adopted for the non uh, statewide plan and para plans. Um, it's different. The 2020 language was put together to handle when a volunteer paid on call pension plan is going away not for utilizing surplus for an existing plan. The statewide volunteer fire plan was named for the, um, for the volunteer and paid, paid on call plans and not created with a conversion to a combination department in mind. The way this language was written puts the volunteer on defense or in other words, we the city or municipality are doing this. You can choose to petition if you want. I don't feel this is fair when really we are asking the volunteer paid on call firefighters to share their investment earnings with the city. I feel the language should reflect this. We are asking the volunteers to share. Um, and the language was created for a 20 or language created for the 2020 bill was the culmination of three different work groups and the germination of that was to make it so there was a template or model language in place when a fire department chose to eliminate the relief association due to necessary model changes. The language proposed here does not handle the potential for converting or dissolving the, of the plan assets, but that can always be done in, the fu in future updates. Categorically, I am in support of this legislation and this offers a good use of severe overfunding scenarios um, up to as much as 135% overfunded, or in other words, a 235% funding level as one plan is. And I'm willing to sit back and see what happens with these 18 plans. However, I have suggested a few simple tweaks to make this legislation more of a negotiation or agreement between the fire department and the plan, whether a relief structure is in place or not, and thereby uh, more in line with the 2020 legislation for the other plans in the state. I think it makes sense to get a few more things right on this. I have always said that in my position, it's part, partly my job to watch out for the little guy, and we need to make sure that they're not taken advantage of here in this legislation. As many pension issues are, this is a deep and complex issue, and I think we are well on the way to a decent bill. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Rosenblum. And before we open it up to questions, I do want to give uh, you uh, my word and the word of this commission that we will continue to work on this issue if it if it shows uh, some hiccups and issue areas that uh, need attention. So um, we'll definitely keep our eye on this. And Mr. Uh, Burkett, do you have anything to say to that too? 
Um, you're, you're well aware of the issues that he brought up. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, um, we've been in discussions with Ms. Rosenblum and, and others who've um, you know, voiced concerns about the legislation and are happy to uh, you know, make any adjustments as needed going forward. Thank you. Are there any questions for the testifiers? Don't see any hands. Um, Representative Murphy or Senator Howe, is there any comments that you would like to make? Representative Murphy, um, you've been Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Murphy. I move that House File 1107 be recommended to pass and be incorporated into the 2021 Omnibus Pension Bill. Thank you for that motion, uh, Representative Murphy. Ms. Deaslin will take the roll. Members, please unmute your yourselves. Chair Rosen. Aye. Senator Fritz. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Jasinski. Aye. Senator Pappas. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Senjum, who has joined us. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Murphy. Aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll votes aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Madam Chair, there are 14 ayes and zero nays. There being 14 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. Uh, okay, so we are on to Senate File 2056, Senator Rosen and House File 2145, Representative Nelson, the State Auditors Fire Relief Association Working Group recommendations. And uh, Ms. Lincheski, would you please review the bill for us? Yes, thank you, Chair Rosen. Susan Lincheski, Director of the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement. Uh, Senate File 2056 and House File 2145 is a compilation of changes to state statutes recommended by the State Auditors Volunteer Fire Relief Association Working Group. The group meets several times every year in the fall and winter to address issues that have arisen in the administration of volunteer firefighter relief associations. I included the, the group's purpose statement in my staff memo. To provide some context, especially for some of our new members, I want to note that there are at least 730 fire departments in the state that employ volunteer firefighters. Of these, approximately 170 uh, fire departments provide retirement benefits to their volunteers through the Paris statewide plan that we were just talking about. The remaining approximately 560 fire, de fire departments provide retirement benefits through relief associations. These reliefs are nonprofits. They have a governing board of trustees and they typically operate with a special fund that pays for the retirement benefits and a general fund. The special fund, as I mentioned, provides the retirement benefits. All board members are fiduciaries subject to the requirements of section 356A of our statutes. Um, the, the bill this year contains nine sections. The state auditor and uh, Rose Hennessy Allen are here to testify on these provisions, so I won't go into detail on them. I will just highlight a few sections in the bill. Section one adds a new definition to uh, chapter 424A, which is the chapter that governs these relief associations. The definition for municipal clerk will allow municipalities to have their required annual financial statements signed by the municipal clerk or another person that they designate to sign those. We discovered an, a technical issue in the last few days that will need to be resolved eventually, probably as a technical amendment that would be included in the omnibus bill. Um, the issue is that um, this definition that's added to ch chapter 424A also appears in chapter 477B, which is the chapter that governs fire state aid. Chapter 477B says that its definitions also apply in chapter 424A. So what we will now have is two definitions, one in chapter 477B and another in 424A for the same term, and these definitions are not identical. So this, this conflict will need to be resolved. 
We also discovered two other definitions that are similarly in conflict in these two chapters, one for fire department and another for municipality. So we'll work with the, uh, the state auditor, the revisor's office and figure out a way to resolve this conflict and bring it back to the commission. I'll skip sections two and three in that they're mainly clarifications. Section four deals with combined service pensions. And I'll mention that this change reduces the flexibility of the relief associations to provide for these combined service pensions. A combined service pension means that a firefighter can receive a retirement benefit from more than one relief association, but have their service with both reliefs combined for purposes of determining vesting in each retirement benefit. Reliefs have the option to provide for combined service pensions, so they are allowed to not require or not provide these benefits. The bill changes the law so that service with the second relief that a firefighter works for can no longer be taken into account in determining vesting percentage under the first relief association. So under current law, the first relief could take into account service for vesting in the second relief. That's current law. This changes it so that's no longer allowed. Um, this again, I think relates to the fact that vesting under these plans is very long. So the idea that you could have a combined service pension that would help you satisfy vesting percentages is actually a really good thing for volunteer firefighters. Jumping to, se to section six of the bill, I'll just mention that this relates to defined contribution relief associations and the allocation of investment earnings and losses. Mostly this section clarifies existing law but it also gives relief associations an additional year to amend their bylaws to comply with changes that we made last session in 2020. Prior to the changes in 2020, a defined contribution relief association, which is um, premised on having an account for every firefighter that will then have contributions and state aid put into it, as well as investment earnings. Prior to 2020, firefighters that left service so they terminated their service as a volunteer, but were not yet age 50. So had to leave their account in the plan. A relief association did not have to credit investment earnings and losses to those deferred member accounts. The law was changed in 2020. Reliefs were required to amend their bylaws to do this. Um, they are now given another uh, year to do that under the, under the, the bill. Um, I'll jump quickly now to section nine of the bill. This is a change that the commission looked at last session. It addresses whether a firefighter can receive more than one supplemental benefit when the, when the firefighter receives more than one retirement benefit. Um, as you may recall from the discussion last year, supplemental benefits are required to be paid by relief associations every time they make a lump sum distribution. A supplemental benefit isn't really a retirement benefit. It's really a payment to the firefighter to help the firefighter pay taxes on the distribution. It's equal to 10% of the distribution up to $1,000. The law wasn't clear on whether a firefighter who receives two distributions could also get two supplemental benefits. The bill clarifies that as it had last year. Um, last session though, it was removed from the bill because there is a somewhat negligible uh, cost to this. Um, I included the fiscal note from last session. Page five of the fiscal note indicates that it will cost approximately $4,500 um, fairly immediately when it um, takes effect, and then will cost an additional 1,500 every year thereafter. The uh, fiscal note notes that this is negligible, but I wanted you all to see that there was a fiscal note and that it does apply again to this, um, to this bill in this particular section. Uh, that's all I have on the, on the bill. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lincheski, and we do have the fiscal note attached too. I'd like to take a look at that. Auditor Blaha, welcome. And would you like to uh, present your bill? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Rosen. Thank you, members of the commission. Uh, I am here today with um, our OSA pension director, Rose Hennessy Allen, and we'll split, um, if that works for you, we'll split the, uh, the description uh, of the bill. 
Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much for hearing this. Uh, always happy to come to the group with our annual bill. As you know, our office oversees almost $40 billion in local government spending with examinations, support and analysis. And this is one of the places where all three of those things come together. Uh, the Fire Relief Association Working Group was formed in 2004 and it brings stakeholders together to vet legislative changes. Now, uh, we have uh, members from, uh, from uh, multiple <laughs> types of uh, uh, geography. We, in fact, uh, worked to expand some of our membership into, uh, to increase the number of people from greater Minnesota uh, this year. They represent each plan type, each service organization. And we also have municipal representatives uh, in our group, as well as the support of LCPR staff, Susan and Chad, our uh, our extremely important members uh, are at the table and our OSA staff uh, as well. Now, one of the, I think the, the reason the, the group has gained so much respect over the years is that we only bring things forward if we have unanimous approval of the group. Uh, it uh, makes sure that this is something that's generally pretty technical and well accepted. And for those of you who have to run Zoom meetings, I think you could be jealous of the fact that I don't have to do roll calls because <laughs> any no stops it. Uh, and so uh, it's been a, a terrific group to work with this year in particular. I would also uh, suggest that uh, each year you see kind of different themes coming up. This year, probably the most um, common theme uh, that came forward was local control. So you'll see a lot of our work includes some consideration of local control, where we'll see a lot of language that is permissive and not um, uh, a, a bright line requirement uh, and trying to give people options at that local level. Uh, so with that, we're going to walk through the sections just quickly. I'll, I'll introduce them. And again, if there's uh, no objection, um, Chair Rosen, uh, uh, Rose will uh, hop in and do a quick overview. I, I do want to mention our section one on the definition of municipal clerk. Uh, and uh, we haven't had a chance to talk yet uh, with, uh, with Susan, but uh, we believe that, uh, that we may, uh, we, that may already be solved in a sense. There is a, a kind of tiebreaker language in um, 645 uh, 0.26 that might help us out here. We may not need further action, but again, um, this is again kind of new, so we want to make sure we give you a ch we get a chance to uh, to walk that through. Um, and with that, uh, um, Ms. Uh, Hennessy Allen, if you'll explain this section. Sure. My name is Rose Hennessy Allen. I'm the pension director at, at the Office of the State Auditor. Uh, section. Thank you. Uh, section one, um, the municipal clerk definition. And the purpose of this definition is to provide municipalities with greater flexibility when signing uh, relief association reporting forms um, so that the municipal official who's most familiar with the relief's operations can sign um, if that person isn't the clerk or the clerk treasurer. Um, sections right. two and three um, are audit clarifications. Uh, relief associations with at least 500,000 in either assets or liabilities are required to have an annual audit. And so these two sections make clear that the financial report and audited financial statements are two separate documents. Um, these sections clarify that the threshold is based on special fund assets only and then also update language so that terminology is consistent. Um, section four, combined service pensions. Um, and this section changes how vesting is calculated as Ms. Lincheski mentioned. Um, so a member's benefit from the first relief association is based solely on service accrued in that relief association. And then if a member joins a second relief association, the service pe pension paid from the second is calculated using a vesting percentage based on the combined years of service. So service um, accumulates and then vesting is based on that combined amount moving forward. Um, and the, the um, change is modeled on the calculation for firefighters in PARA's um, statewide volunteer firefighter plan. Um, section five um, amends the defined contribution section for members who leave before they're vested. Um, so when a member leaves service in a DC plan before becoming vested, the relief association must wait at least five years and then forfeits that non-vested account. Um, and so this section of the bill provides an exception to that five-year waiting period if the former member dies and no survivor benefit is payable. 
Um, section six um, um, provides additional clarity to changes that were included in the 2020 pension bill um, that affect how net investment earnings are allocated to members in the defined contribution plans. And so there was um, a question posed in the staff summary on this section, and we wanted to, to clarify and correct the meaning of the language around the bylaws and the deadline in the bill. Um, so first, there is no requirement that a relief association do anything in its bylaws to respond to the new law. Um, it allows a relief association to amend its bylaws to reflect one of the three permitted methods of calculating interest. But if a relief association chooses not to um, amend its bylaws to um, specify one of those three methods, then the law provides that a, a method by default will be the third alternative that's provided in the law. Um, and then the significance in the bill of the January 1, 2022 deadline is to provide a temporary exception to the law that um, would prevent bylaw changes that take effect after a member separates from active service from applying to that member. Um, so in other words, provided that a relief association adopts its choice of method by January 1, um, the relief association can have that method apply to all deferred members, uh, regardless of when they deferred. And so this avoids them having to calculate interest differently for different groups of deferred members. Um, section seven, um, permits relief associations to eliminate service credit of a former firefighter after that person has been gone from firefighting service for at least five years. And this change addresses concerns raised by some of the working group members about firefighters who return to active service after a lengthy break and they're added back to the relief association's books with a liability higher than that of a new member and without having accounted for that liability during the break in service. So the five-year waiting period for these um, in this section for the defined benefit plans is consistent with what's permitted for um, the defined contribution plans. Um, section eight clarifies that filing and application fees payable by the relief association to federal or other government entities um, can be paid uh, from the special fund only if the fees are necessary to administer the fund. Um, and then the final section, supplemental benefits. Um, again, these are benefits, they're in addition to the service pension that's paid out and they're intended to help offset income taxes that are paid on the distribution. Um, and statute currently is not clear about what happens if a firefighter receives more than one lump sum distribution. Um, section nine clarifies that a supplemental benefit is payable with each lump sum distribution and, and that the relief association or para can apply for reimbursement of each benefit paid. Wonderful. Yes, uh, Auditor Laha. Thank you, Senator Lewis and uh, members of the commission. Uh, we, uh, and that's again, the, the great technical work that our team did this year. So again, special thanks to um, all of the members of the working group that came together, uh, especially in a, a challenging year to figure out how to use Zoom. Uh, and as always, of course, special thanks to uh, Mr. Burkett and Ms. Lincheski, who are there with us every step of the way. And we uh, truly appreciate that. Uh, and then with that, we'll, uh, we can wait and be available for questions after your testifiers, other testifiers. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we just have one testifier, Mr. Johnson, who was on the working group, and he's from the State Fire Department Association. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Please state your name for the record. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's Ron Johnson. Uh, I'm a representative of the uh, Minnesota State Fire Department Association. I'm one of the volunteers. There's two of us on the working group. Uh, my background is was 20 years as treasurer and firefighter in Maple Grove, um, and uh, continued to provide, I have the very great opportunity of teaching out in the field. So I'm all over the state in a number of different, different locations. So I really have a chance to be in touch with, uh, with the firefighters and the, and the issues that they have around pension. And um, Clearly there's, uh, these are the kinds of things that the working group um, embraces and I think moves forward. And I, thanks to Auditor Blaha, I think we've, we've really been able to um, take a hard look at a lot of things that the uh, uh, that are and help us bring up to uh, to date the, uh, the the legislation. 
Um, at this point, I can answer any questions if that's available, um, but I definitely want to say that the working group has done a, a, a great job this past year, I think. And um, clearly the, the kinds of issues that are out uh, being proposed um, are, are some that we hope that uh, um, will take some serious thought and, and move, move forward. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for your service on the working group too. Really appreciate that. My pleasure. Yes, thank you. Um, any questions for Mr. Johnson, State Auditor Blaha, or Ms. Hennessy Allen? See any hands coming up? Oh yes, Senator Senjum. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this this may be real rather trivial, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. On in Subdivision Two B, where it defines a municipal clerk, uh, if uh, if you have a municipal clerk but that clerk is somehow incapacitated. But again, you still have, you still have that person. Uh, is, it, is it important to have an alternative? I, I don't see that there's an alternative function here uh, as worded at least. State Auditor Blaha, would you like to take that or Ms. Hennessy Allen? Would love to have Ms. Hennessy Allen uh, <laughs> speak to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ms. Hennessy Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. Um, so um, if the municipal clerk is unable to perform those duties, um, a, another municipal um, official could be designated um, to perform that function. Uh, Senator Sanjo. Madam Chair, uh, I think that's the logical answer, but I don't, I don't see these, I don't see the, the language, if you get right down to the words, I don't see the language allows that. That was my point. Ms. Tennessee Allen, do, does that does that need to be clarified in that first paragraph, subdivision two B? Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I'll just say it, it, as it reads, it, it, you know, the municipal clerk shall perform the function, so called, or if there is no such person, in other words, if there's no if there's no municipal clerk, then the others can do it. But if there is a municipal clerk that's uh, that's up in the hospital, uh, incapacitated. It doesn't say anywhere in here, and again, I'm just being a nerd about this, I guess, but it doesn't say in this that there's anybody else that would have the authority uh, to function uh, in the event that there was an incapacitated individual. Um, Senator Rosen, I don't know if I can maybe speak to that too. Yes, Senator Baha. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rosen, and, um, uh, and, Senator, uh, I, and by the way, never, ever apologize for nerdiness. That is something we are always a huge fan of. Uh, but I, I think you're, I understand your point is well taken that there's nothing in there that's explicit, explicitly um, suggests that you can do that. But you can certainly, if somebody is capacitated, you can appoint, you know, somebody to be an interim in their position. And I, and I don't think that there's, there would be a problem, I think, as um, uh, Ms. Hennessy Allen suggested, uh, if you designate somebody to fill in for somebody, you know, who is uh, taking over while that person is capacity, I don't, we don't think that this would prohibit that. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure if we need to change that uh, because well, I think- Madam Chair, there's that kind of an off-ramp, but I, I don't see that off-ramp, but you know, uh, I've, I've just brought it up if it's important. To, would it be, be in any other part of the statute that defines municipal clerk? that would um, designate a opportunity. Hmm. Ms. Lancheski, do you have any thoughts? Yes, Senator Rosen, um, this definition is very similar to the one in chapter 477B, the one that it conflicts with. Um, but if, if it is determined that we will make some technical changes here to rec reconcile this conflict, we could very easily put in something to the effect that if the munis municipal clerk is incapacitated, then um, one of these officials could do it. So, yeah. you know, if that if that's satisfactory to the commission, we can certainly come back um, with that in addition to the resolution of the conflict. Yeah, I think um, Senator Senjum, if you're okay with that, we could have. Uh, um, staff working on that because sure. as Ms. Lancheski says, we do have to do a technical amendment in the omnibus <laughs> bill. But Madam Chair, I, 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 I have belabored the collision long enough on this, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to take it any further. I just, right. I just saw it and uh, I just brought it up. Thank you. Oh, Representative Driscoll. Oh, you're 
Oh, there, there you go. go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since we are already halfway across the river with Rep uh, Senator Senjum's question, <laughs> the only thing that I would point out for clarification is that should this be a municipal clerk as defined by township statute, that is an elected and not appointed position. So I think that needs to be taken into account here as well, because there isn't a provision probably to appoint a deputy clerk or a replacement clerk in that elected office position. So something for statutory research, you don't have a, uh, uh, have taken an issue up in a couple of years because you missed that one. Okay. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll continue to work on this. That, that's, that's great advice, Representative O'Driscoll. Um, with that, I don't see any more hands and uh, Representative Nelson, would you like to take, make a motion, please? Let me get out. Let me get off mute here. Yes, I'll move that we include this in the uh, in the pension bill. Thank you, Representative uh, Nelson. Moves Senate File Twenty Fifty Six and House File Twenty One Forty Five be recommended to pass and be incorporated into the Twenty Twenty One Omnibus Pension Bill. Ms. Dieslin, will you take the roll, please? Members, please unmute your microphones. On the bill, Chair Rosen. Aye. Senator Prince. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Jasinski. Aye. Senator Pappas. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Senjum. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy. I'm sorry, Murphy, aye. Thank you. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Representative O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll was aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Madam Chair, there are 14 ayes and zero nays. There being 14 ayes and zero nays, the motion does prevail. Have a fake gavel. Uh, with that, we have Senate file number 1925, Senator Abler's bill, a bill for a Ramsey Fire Relief Association and Nowthin firefighters providing full vesting and distribution of accounts to firefighters assigned to the Nowthin Fire Station. And uh, Ms. Lincheski, would you please do an overview? Yes, thank you, Senator Rosen. Uh, Senate file 1925, House file 2192 is needed to assist the cities of Nalvin and Ramsey as they wrap up the process of ending their joint powers arrangement. Through that arrangement, uh, fire services were provided for the city of Nalvin by the Ramsey Fire Department. The Ramsey Fire Department will terminate the employment of 14 firefighters assigned to the Nalvin Fire Station in the next couple months or two or three months. These firefighters are referred to in the bill as Nowthen firefighters. So they're assigned to the Nowthen station, but they have been employed by Ramsey. Nowthen has contracted with the city of St. Francis to, to assist it in it, establishing its own fire department. It is anticipated that many of the Nowthen firefighters will in fact become employed by, by the new Nowthen fire department. The bill is needed to provide for full vesting an earlier distribution to the Nalvin firefighters of their retirement benefits in the Ramsey relief. The bill also addresses fire state aid for Nalvin and earlier participation by Nalvin in the Para statewide fi firefighter plan. And that plan then will provide the retirement benefits for the Nalvin firefighters. Um, you may recall that a bill on this topic was addressed by the commission last session. It became law. Um, that bill provided for the transfer of accounts from the Ramsey relief to another relief association, either with another municipality or a new relief. Um, in addition, um, Nalvin was going to um, make some other changes and had um, a number of decisions that they needed to make since then. Um, they have made those decisions. Um, Nalvin has decided to establish its own fire department and has decided to join the statewide plan instead of establish its own fire relief. Therefore, the bill is needed now, and it does two things. One, it does repeal the 2020 session law. So this will now um, control what is uh, going to happen with the Ramsey relief. It then does um, 
put into place these additional changes. Each now then firefighter is going to be given credit for 12 months of service under section one of the bill so that they will be able to share in the allocation of fire state aid for 2021. The second thing that it does for the now then firefighters is it requires that their accounts in the Ramsey relief will become 100% vested. And then they will be given the opportunity to take their account in a distribution or to roll it into another retirement plan or an um, IRA. Section two of the bill provides that now then will receive fire state aid payable in 2022. That's paid typically in October of next. So it would be a year from this coming October. Um, this will get paid to now then even though it, is, it will not have been operational. It's, it's fire department will not have been operational for the entire 2021 calendar year which is required under current law in order to get um, an allocation of fire state aid. Section three permits now then to join the Paris statewide plan mid-year. Under current law, you can't join that plan until January 1st. So the change in the bill will allow them to join as soon as they're ready, uh, made the election and have uh, had the approval of their city council. And then finally, section four repeals the 2020 session law. That's my description of uh, this bill. Thank you, Ms. Lincheski. And with us, we have uh, Ramsey Fire Chief uh, Matt Croner. Welcome to the committee, Chief Croner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. Uh, I'm Matt Croner, Fire Chief for the City of Ramsey Fire Department. Uh, Chief Croner, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Uh, Let's try that again. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. So it says your, your connection is unstable, so we'll do the best we can here. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. Uh, I am Matt Conner, Fire Chief for the Ramsey Fire Department, testifying in support of Senate File Number 1925. 12 years ago, the City of Ramsey entered into a contract with the City of Nelden to provide fire service for the community of Nelden with the whole intent to prepare now then to create their own department. Now then is now in a place they feel comfortable moving forward with their own department and they have obtained facilities, apparatus and staff. The passing of this bill is important to the firefighters to ensure they receive their years of service for the purposes of receiving 2021 fire state aid, any contributions and any forfeitures to their accounts. And the bill provides full vesting uh, and uh, immediate distribution of their accounts. City of Ramsey and now then along with the Ramsey Relief Association have worked together to draft this bill and are in support of how it is written. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Coroner. I do have a question for you. If you yes. um, and before I mention, ask you the question, I know this bill has been around quite a while. It seems like we've been working on this. And I know Senator Abler would love to be here to talk about this, but he's in a marathon hearing for his committee. And I think they're going all night. The agenda was pretty impressive. So I just wanted to, to let you know that he certainly would be here if he could. I appreciate that. And my question was how many of the, how many of the firefighters are you gonna be hiring from the Nalvin, would you say? Are you gonna be hiring the full, what was it, 14 of them? Um, yes, I'm, I'm actually for, I'm actually the uh, fire chief for the city of Ramsey, so. Now then we'll be uh, planning on hiring the 14 firefighters through an application. Now they will. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that would that would take care of all of them. All right, super. And we also have Mayor Jeff uh, Pilon. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. Uh, I am Jeff Pilon, the Mayor of the City of Now Then. Uh, I'm serving my fourth term as Mayor. Uh, I joined the uh, city Council when we became a city back in 2008 and I have served on the, as a fire board member uh, since we became a city uh, under the joint powers agreement we currently have in place between Ramsey and now then and I'm testifying in support of the bill as well. Uh, the city of now then uh, representatives that work closely with the city of Ramsey uh, administrative staff fire chief and relief association along with the state uh, legislative staff on the language in this bill and the city of now then is in agreement that this legislation serves uh, the city firefighters in both Ramsey uh, as we separate and the new fire department that we're setting up in now then and it serves us well. So uh, I, uh, I do 
agree with the chief that uh, this is a good bill going forward. And I, I thank the staff for their work on it. And uh, I thank you for your consideration of this legislation. And that concludes my remarks. Well, thank you, Mayor. I do have a question also. When, it, when do you think you're gonna be taking the vote with the city council, Malden city council? The, uh, the vote, um, we have, obviously we're already in the process of, of transitioning. We have uh, contracted with the uh, city of St. Francis for uh, chief and associate or assistant chief services. So we already are moving forward. Um, we anticipate that um, the department will be ready to go uh, in April. And so the council is in uh, full support of that at this time. So, Are there any questions for the chief uh, owner or the mayor Pilon? Pilon, excuse me, am I saying it right? Pilon, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? Senator Howe. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and as a co-author of the bill, I, 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 I am in support of it. The, the question I have are, are all 14 of the uh, active firefighters assigned to the now then fire station going to become active firefighters and employees of the now then fire department? Uh, we, that was my question, but I kind of got it screwed up. Mayor uh, Elon. <laughs> thank you, Chair and Senator. Yes, um, we, we don't know that this time. Right now, they are in support as we've been talking with them, uh, that there's uh, certainly the interest to join. There will be a process um, by which there'll be interviews and, and uh, evaluations. But the anticipation is at this time that uh, the 14 that are signed to the station are interested and we are interested as well. But that's up to the chief and his uh, interview process to make the final decision. Senator Howell, follow up. No, that's, it's, it's just important. And, and having been a volunteer chief before, I know how difficult it is to recruit and retain uh, those individuals. So I I, uh, I commend you on your, this is a large task to start a department. So uh, I uh, I hope that you continue with that enthusiasm and, and are successful in your endeavor. Well, thank you, Senator Hill. Thank you, Senator. Are there any further questions from the members? With that, Senator Howe, would you please move Senate file 1925 and House file 2192 be recommended to pass and incorporated into the 2021 Omnibus Pension Bill. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Howe. On that motion, uh, Ms. Deaslin, would you please take the roll? Members, please unmute your microphones. Chair Rosen. Aye. Senator Prince. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Jasinski. Aye. Senator Pappas. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Senjum. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Murphy. Aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Madam Chair, there are 14 ayes and zero nays. There be 14 ayes and zero nays. The motion does prevail. Okay, members, we are clicking along here. Um, we have uh, number five on your agenda, Senate file 950, Senator Pappas, and House file 407, Representative Nelson, the MSRS increases the benefit for a former Department of Labor and Industry employee due to erroneous benefit estimate information from MSRS. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Burkett, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just provide a brief overview of the bill. Um, Senate file 950, House file 407, is special legislation to address an issue for a single individual, uh, Mr. David Musilevich. Uh, Mr. Musilevich retired from state service on June 2nd, 2018. Uh, prior to retiring, Mr. Musilevich requested and received several estimates from MSRS for his benefit in the general plan. Taken together, taken together the estimates indicated that if Mr. Musilevich retired on June 2nd, 2018, he would be eligible for a 75% join a survivor annuity of about $3,452. Um, 
However, all of the estimates provided by MSR estimates calculated the annuity amount. After Mr. Musilevich retired, um, MSR has correctly calculated that he was actually eligible for an annuity of $3,139.91 per month, a difference of about $312 per month. The estimates provided to Mr. Musilevich by MSRS were inaccurate because of an error in the software that MSRS uses to calculate its benefits. Uh, Mr. Musilevich is eligible for a benefit under a set of rules called the Rule of 90, uh, which allowed him to receive the better of two, uh, the better of the two benefits um, using, using a, one of two different calculation methods. Uh, the first is a, called the step method, which uses a multiplier of 1.2% for the first 10 years and 1.7% thereafter, but does not apply an early retirement uh, penalty. And the second is the level method, um, which is the typical method used for calculating a benefit and uses 1.7% for all years, but does apply an early retirement penalty. The error in the MSRS software results in, resulted in a step method calculation that erroneously calculated the first 10 years of Mr. Musilevich's benefit at 1.7% instead of 1.2%. This resulted in MSRS communicating um, an inaccurately high amount to Mr. Musilevich where 1.7% was used for all years, um, but no early retirement reduction factor was applied. Senate file 950 house file 407 acts to increase Mr. Musilevich's benefit to the amount he would have received if MSRS's estimates had been accurate. It's a, the bill is in one section with four subdivisions. Uh, subdivision one entitles the eligible person to an increased benefit. Subdivision two defines the eligible person so the term can only apply to Mr. Musilevich. Um, subdivision three defines the increased benefit as the amount Mr. Musilevich would have received if his benefit had not been reduced for early retirement. It also requires MSRS to pay Mr. Musilevich any back pay resulting from the change back to the day he would have received his retirement benefit annuity. And um, subdivision four clarifies that the increased benefit replaces Mr. Musilevich's current benefit and includes language to construe that section narrowly only for that purpose. Uh, there are two points uh, from the analysis section I'd like to highlight for the commission. Uh, the first is that this issue was appealed to the MSRS board the issue was sent to administrative law judge and the administrative law judge issued a recommendation to MSRS. Um, that recommendation, which is included in your materials and in the public materials, um, includes an indicator that, it, that it, it has not public data in it. And this is included in your materials and publicly um, with Mr. Musilevich's permission. The ALJ set forth facts, that's the administrative law judge, set forth facts um, related to this issue and um, the commission may find some of these findings relevant to weighing the equities involved here. Some of the key facts include that MSRS was aware of an error in their estimation software when the estimates were issued. Uh, another is that MSRS estimates include a disclaimer, include disclaimers such as, uh, and I'm quoting here, this estimate is based on current information, changes to your work pattern or legislative actions could affect the final monthly benefit amount and we reserve the right to correct errors and prepare a new estimate. Um, another fact for the commission to consider was that there was not an alternative for Mr. Musilevich to receive a more accurate estimate for his retirement benefit. And finally, the difference between the two monthly benefits, again, was about $312 or nearly 10% of the actual benefit. Uh, Madam Chair, that completes the overview of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Um, we have two testifiers on the bill. Um, our first one is uh, Mr. Musilevic. Got that, I think. <laughs> uh, please state your name for the record, please. Hello, uh, my name is David Musilevich and, and I'm the retiree that this bill addresses. And um, I just wanna thank you, uh, Chair uh, Rosen for hearing this and for to Senator Pappas and Representative Nelson for authoring it and to Representative Pinto for helping me put it together. And I consulted with Representative Her last year about it briefly. I also wanna thank the staff, uh, Chad Burkett and Susan Lenchevsky, who I've talked to about this at some length and, and to the MSRS board for, for supporting it or, or at least taking a position supportive of it because I presented this language to them and asked for their help 
Mike Ledoux was very important on, in, in that. Um, I just would say a couple of things. One is uh, the facts are, uh, I, I don't want to repeat all the facts Mr. Burkett presented. Um, I, I just want to say it was a real tough day when I found out that I was cut 10%. I didn't expect that. I had planned carefully for a couple of years uh, at choosing my retirement time thoughtfully. Um, I did, uh, at, after getting the estimates before filling out the application, I submitted the application on April 4th, 2018. I did call the MSRS office and ask them if I should come in. And I told them I had the estimates at hand and I also had the online calculator uh, results. And they said they really couldn't give me any more data than that. Um, and, 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 and that it wasn't necessary for me to, to come in. And the other thing I would also say is that uh, later in the course of, of, of pursuing this appeal, I did go to their office and spoke with one of their staff people. I, was, I wanted to look at my file before the hearing with Judge Lippman. And um, I found out there that the 2016 uh, annual benefit statement I'd been given was also wrong. And so they'd been wrong for a couple of years. And the reason they didn't send me a 2017, 2018 or a 2018 annual benefit statement, they told me at the time, was they knew those were wrong uh, that, and, they, and, um, and, and, and didn't wanna send them out. Um, I, I also wanna just thank uh, one of the, the kindest things that happened was uh, when, when uh, um, the executive director, Aaron Leonard, sent me a letter telling me that they couldn't adjust the benefit. She did apologize and to admit that it was a mistake. And I've always appreciated that because up to then, it always felt like I'd screwed up. And, and, I, and I don't think I did. I think I did everything I could. And then finally, I just want to point out in Judge Lippman's or, um, findings, in his memorandum at the end, he did talk about MSRS's um, conduct in this and did, 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 did spell out that, that he felt that um, the agency, uh, uh, the agency's conduct was not very, very um, appropriate and it wasn't a model of good government. I just would steer you to that language. Uh, with that, I, I'll stand for questions and I just thank you and the members of the commission for hearing this and giving and, and taking it under consideration. Well, thank you, Mr. Musilevic. I am going to get this right, I promise. It's Musilevich. Musilevich. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that correction. I appreciate it because it's just maddening when you get it wrong. And this bill has been around a long time too. I know that. Um, I do. The next testifier is Ms. Leonard from MSRS. Welcome, Ms. Leonard. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, my name is Erin Leonard. <clears throat> I'm the Executive Director of MSRS. And I'm here this evening to speak to Senate File 950, House File 407, which will increase the benefit of a specific member, Mr. David Musilevich, who was originally in the MSRS Unclassified Plan and transferred to the MSRS General Plan. My intent is to provide background on the plans, context for the error, just so you better understand, and overall support for this legislation which will really is the only remedy that can be provided to Mr. Musilevich. This MSRS board didn't have authority to increase the benefit in this case. To give you a little background, the unclassified plan is a defined contribution plan with very unique features. Certain members may elect general plan coverage within specified timeframes, depending on when they are appointed or um, to their positions. When preparing the benefit estimates, MSRS provides both unclassified plan and general plan information to educate the plan members and help them make um, decisions which may be most beneficial for them in the future. Additionally, depending on when the members were first covered by a Minnesota Public Pension Plan, they may be also eligible for Rule of 90. So this adds a third potential benefit calculation for comparison purposes for these members. In recent years, MSRS systems did go through an initial modernization effort that was completed in 2015. So that was the first phase. We of course continue, continue to improve and modernize each year on uh, multiple times per year. This modernization effort increased the automation of calculations and expanded the availability of self-service for plan members, which allows them to estimate their benefits um, and plan for their retirement on their own as well. 
Following the initial project, individuals who transitioned from the unclassified plan to the general plan and were also eligible for Rule 90, so they met all three criteria, had an issue um, or defect in the system which calculated their benefits incorrectly. When this issue was identified and escalated to management, the online calculator was disabled and so were their annual statements that showed any estimates. So that would explain why Mr. Musilevich received a statement in 2016, but he didn't receive one in 2017 with estimates. Um, when an individual needed these estimates, they would have to request them from staff and we would have to calculate them. In the case of Mr. Musilevich, Mr. S staff did prepare the estimate, but didn't manually override the information and correct the defect. So this was a human error that caused Mr. Musilevich to receive the wrong estimate information while he was making his retirement decisions. Of course, we strive for 100% accuracy when relaying information to plan members. These are important decisions that they're making for their, for their lifetime. And I take full responsibility for this error. The MSRS board is also sympathetic to the situation and authorized me to assist Mr. Musilevich with his request to seek special legislation. In addition, the board asked staff to review accounts of similar, similarly situated individuals to ensure that they receive the corrected estimates and benefit amounts. Um, with that review, 29 individuals were in similar circumstances and could have potentially been impacted. In all cases, um, they were provided correct information in their estimates and their final calculations. Um, and just for reference, in that same time frame, we processed over 10,700 um, new retirement benefits um, that were all that through that whole time period. So this is a very unique set of circumstances, a unique situation. And unfortunately, it was an error that um, we would like remedied for Mr. Musilevich. So in closing, I do apologize for this error and ask for you to consider including this legislation in the omnibus pension bill. Thank you. You're muted. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Are there any questions for our testifier? I was muted because I was practicing Mr. Muslovich's name. <laughs> That's what I was doing. Senator Howe. Muslovich. Uh, Muslovich. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Say uh, to Ms. Leonard, is there, is there anyone else that, that got bad information and got the wrong and made a retirement decision off of bad information provided by MSRS? that we should be correcting? Ms. Leonard. Madam Chair, um, Senator Hout, in this set of circumstances, no, I we've reviewed all of them. We did a query, analyzed the data, analyzed the individuals, um, and there was not an error. And the error in our system was specific to those three situations. An individual who had unclassified plan coverage decided to switch to the general plan, as well as started before July 1, 1989, and was eligible for Rule of 90, and then in addition to that, if they were um, retiring under that step formula, so if they were retiring past age 63, it also would not affect them. So it was a, a small group of people and we, we verified that they were all done correctly. Perfect storm, Senator Howard. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna make sure if we're doing this, we should do it for everybody that got a bad, uh, a, a bad uh, set of information and not just uh, not this this individual. So it's it's good that uh, we're taking care of everybody. Uh, Ms. Leonard, thoughts on that? No. Um, Senator I, Senator Rosen and Senator Hall, I agree, and that's why we really scrubbed and made sure we we are collecting um, gathering anyone that would be in these set of circumstances. Thank you, and thank you for for the the uh, graceful way of handling this. Appreciate that. Uh, any further questions? Well, to our testifiers, I do appreciate you coming. Oh, Senator Pappas, there you go. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I just wanna thank you for hearing this bill and, and thank Ms. Leonard and everyone who helped solve this problem. And for Mr. Musilevich, Levich, <laughs> no, I stumbled, <laughs> for um, kind of sticking to it um, and being you know persistent with it. Uh, luckily, he's familiar enough with state government that sometimes he knows that's what you have to do. So, and then I'll be ready to make the motion unless my colleague, Representative Nelson, wants to make it. You can go ahead, Representative, uh, or Senator Pappas. I don't want to murder his name either. 
<laughs> Senator Pappas on that, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Then I would move that Senate Bill 950, House Bill 407, be recommended to pass and be incorporated into the 2021 Omnibus Pension Bill. On that motion, uh, Ms. Dieslin, would you please take the roll? Members, please unmute your microphones. Chair Rosen. Aye. Senator Fritz. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Jasinski. Aye. Senator Pappas. Aye. Senator Rarick. Aye. Senator Senjum. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Murphy. Aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll votes aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Madam Chair, there are 14 ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Ms. Easlin. On that, there being 14 ayes and zero nays, the motion does prevail. So members, we do have time to jump into the report on the LCPR study of post-retirement adjustments, the COLAs that's gotten a, um, a little bit of attention here lately. And we do have um, six testifiers that are here tonight. I just wanted to make sure that, um, that the approval of the study is just recognizing the principles. Um, uh, well, basically, there's some controversy about this COLA study. There is an amendment that uh, Senator French said he would offer, but I think there's some worry that there, these, um, this study is going to codify basically uh, you know, the principles. And we haven't looked at the principles for a very, very long time. Um, Ms. Lancheski, it's been at least 10 years. Is that correct? Correct? Yeah, 2009, I believe, Chad, is that the date um, on the most recent version? Yeah, so it has been many years. Um, there was um, some work done uh, when Chair, or when uh, Representative Murphy was chair. Um, uh, some of you may re remember uh, that there was quite a bit of work done to come up with a restatement of the principles, but um, at the end of, of the day, that was not approved. Okay, well, thank you. I'm. I'm just going after um, some of the notes that we have here, but <clears throat> it, it's all we're doing in this bill or in this study is referring to the principles. I do would like to take a poll or the temperature of this commission on if you'd like to jump into the principles at some point, that would be something I would love to do. Probably not in the next couple of weeks because we do have a poll agenda uh, that we'll talk about after we we um, have this this discussion on the study, but the A one the one A amendment would would simply change the language to make sure that it's clear what the intent of the study is, and with that, um, Ms. Lancheski, could you clarify that a little bit better so we. So we can move forward with the testimony and then we'll go to Representative Driscoll after you have a chance to talk about this study and what, what it basically means. Senator Rosen, could I turn this over to Chad, uh, Mr. Burkett, who has uh, done quite a bit of work on this? Yes, thank you, Mr. Burkett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We, we did prepare an amendment um, based on the concerns that we heard at the last meeting. The amendment um, simply strikes one paragraph from page 17 and you can find this amendment, I think, with your materials, um, or uh, there's a link to it on the agenda. It strikes one paragraph from page 17 that um, contained a reference to some concerns that we had regarding ambiguity in the principles. And then it makes the language of the principle that applies to post-retirement benefit increases um, the commission's statement on what the purpose of the post-retirement increase is um, in our conclusion. And you can see what they look, I guess the word would be engrossed um, um, on the third and fourth, second and third pages of the amendment. Um, so I think, I think it's probably worth noting that the conclusion at the very end of the report, which would be page 57 of the report, would now state, we conclude that retirement benefits should be increased during the period of retirement to offset the impact of economic inflation 
over time in order to maintain a retirement benefit that was adequate at the time of retirement. And again, that language is just taken directly from the current principle. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would so, be the amendment, um, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Burkett. So we did have a, a review of this study on March 2nd. So we have been through that. We certainly can address any other issues with that. And um, I'm thinking of perhaps we should adopt the amendment before we have testifiers. Uh, Mr. Burkett, this amendment has been posted. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Representative Ojisko. Madam Chair, it, and this may not be the uh, exact right moment, but you had asked about what are the wishes of reviewing the um, pension commission principles and the like. I think that's a great idea to do maybe in the off season. Um, we do have the abbreviated legislative session where we can all catch our breath a bit and who knows, maybe be able to meet in person for a change. That might be kind of a novel idea. Yeah, and, and I'll bring snacks for sure. Um, great idea. Uh, Representative Murphy. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I we talked about the the principles, and I agree that. And, and when I was chair, we did do the reviewing and the updating um, at that time during the interim, or we we did most of our meeting and our work during the interim, and then in session we. Uh, adopted the principles as updated. And uh, do you remember so what year that was, Representative Murphy? I don't uh, exactly. It's been a long time. But, and I didn't, I was gonna look it up, but actually I haven't had any time to look it up. And that was my, what I was leading up to um, this very comprehensive report uh, that's been before us and that since December, but we've never had, we didn't have any earlier meetings um, except for the review of it. And I really wanna hear what's said tonight by the people that have offered to testify, but I am not ready to approve the POLA report because I feel it's important that uh, we talk about what led up to it. And uh, we have new members of the house, new house members, as well as uh, myself and Representative Nelson and Representative Her and Representative Driscoll. But I would like a meeting of the house people before we talk about this. And also, I think we need more testimony from the Department of Administration, the Department of Revenue, and um, budget management uh, about the COLA report. Did they have any input into it, or did they have any? Uh, do they have any concerns about it? So I don't think we've uh, got quite enough information at this time to uh, approve it. But I am very anxious to hear what um, the testifiers are prepared to talk about tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative Murphy. And you know, I know the, the intent of this study is what we're going to get into. Um, I would like the testifiers to take a look at that amendment, the 1A amendment, and make your testimony in reference to that too, if that is adopted. And perhaps uh, we will not be able to move forward with this vote tonight. Um, but, I, but I do want everybody to know that we are certainly willing to, to adjust uh, what we have to, to make sure that there's some comfort language in this study and it needs to be basically codified. Um, but we don't have time to, to work on this on the principles, which is just like I said, being referenced in um, in this report. 
So with that, we will start with Mr. Brian Rice. Madam Welcome. Chair, would you like the amendment moved? Not yet. Thank you, uh, Senator Franz. I think we'll wait a little bit. Thank right. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Rice. Uh, man. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's so nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Brian Rice. I'm here tonight representing the Minnesota Police Fraternal Association. That's a group of over 800 uh, retired police officers and widows who are covered by the Para Police and Fire Plan. And Mr. Parsons, uh, Chris, from the Professional Firefighters cannot make it tonight, and so I also represent them, and my comments will apply to them. There's 2,000 firefighters he represents. Um, let me start by saying this is really one of the most consequential studies that I've seen, and it's extremely well done. Um, it's a 59-page report. You had about a 20-page PowerPoint, but it's really worth reading, and it's a very, very important uh, study for this reason. Over 10% of all Minnesotans are covered by these pension plans of working Minnesotans, probably 12%. And that, that's 300,000 uh, workers in the state. There's 200,000 retirees who derive a lot of their income security from these 70, 80, maybe $90 billion in pension assets. So what you do as a pension commission is extremely, extremely important. Um, and I, I have three main points to this and the study validates several of them. First, we have never gotten these COLAs right. The, the study shows that in the 70s, our retirees were literally wiped out by inflation. We did not have a good mechanism to keep up with inflation. The legislature adjusted and then in the 80s and the, in the 90s, we overpaid the retirees. Then we pared back and for the last 20 years, it's gotten tighter and tighter and tighter to the point that this study is now saying that potentially some of the people that I represent, if you go on another 20 years with a 1% COLA, they're gonna see a 30% reduction in their standard of living. Because the people I, that I'm speaking for, the basic members do not get social security. Their entire pension is derived from what you do at the state capitol. And right now they're at 1%. It was a shared sacrifice in 2018. We absolutely needed to do it to save the pensions. Nobody's disagreeing with that policy. It was a monumental achievement, but going forward, um, I think this study that Mr. Burkhardt uh, prepared and the Pension Commission staff did sounded an alarm bell. And I re really urge you as commission members, my project prediction is that over the next several years, you're going to have to wrestle with this issue, particularly if inflation takes off. Um, and so we never got it right. And I'm not blaming the legislature because I've been doing this for 39 years. I didn't get it right. It was you did the best you could at the time with what you had. Secondly, we do pensions on the cheap in Minnesota. Nationwide, the average spending on state and local government is 5.2% of all revenues goes into pensions. Minnesota is 2.3%. Now that's a 19, 2018 measure before Senator Rosen's major bill passed. And so I expect that to go up. But Minnesota ranks 47th in the nation on what you spend on pensions. Government does pensions on the cheap. Three, four weeks ago, you learned that we have the Nick Saban of pension investment in Minnesota. His name is Mansco Perry. The SBI has been a top performer for 40 years. They're in the top 10% regularly. They're always in the top uh, quintile. He is Nick Saban of pension investment. So we have great pension investing. The other uh, study I gave you is that uh, public employees in Minnesota pay more than the minute, than the average of all their public employees around the country. The average public employee throughout the United States that's coordinated with Social Security pays 6% of their salary on pensions. The lowest contribution you get from your Minnesota employees is 6% with MSRS. It's 65 for PRA, PRA and it's 75 for, for teachers. That's what leads to the conclusion that the government is doing pensions on the cheap. And I'm not blaming that. I'm just saying that I believe that's a fact and the third thing is, and I'll conclude with this, I do think that the Pension Commission has tried to do our, your best. We've tried to honor those promises. And yes, I have worked on this for 39 years. I sat through the first Pension Commission principles with Senator Don Moe and Representative Leo Redding, and then Representative Richard Jefferson and Don Betzel in the 90, uh, and uh, uh, Mary Murphy and you, Senator Rosen in 2009. And there's always been that statement that the policy of the Pension Commission is try to maintain the retirement at, 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 and protect it from inflation. 
And I think that the, I do, would support the uh, COLA 1A amendment that uh, Senator France has moved. I think that corrects that. And I, I don't think the fight to, uh, about this, it's really, what are you gonna do about the COLAs? They are very expensive. They're very costly, but I think this is gonna be the issue when you see the uh, diminution of pensions that Mr. Burkhardt in this study has laid out. It's not just to the basic members that I represent, but it's to all of them. And so with that, Yes to the 1A amendment, and it's a very consequential report. Um, I'd encourage you all to read it, and uh, I hope I could see you all in person. It's kind of like uh, seeing my sisters and brothers on a Zoom call. So thank you for indulging me, Madam Chair. It's good to see you too, Mr. Rice. Um, and I do, I do uh, want to remind everybody the principles are a guiding, a guiding force. So that's, and they do need to be looked, and I'm glad you have that institutional memory, Mr. Rice, 2009. Um, we'll, and we'll wait for questions afterwards, if you don't mind, we'll get off through the testimony. Uh, Ms. Sundin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Louise Sundin. I'm representing the Minneapolis Committee of 13 and the Retired Teachers Chapter 59 were 8,000 educators, 5,000 retired, 3,000 still working and in the Minneapolis schools. So on their behalf, I'm pleased to welcome the new commission members. Uh, for you especially, I want to start just for a second with who we are. Um, we are still the largest single group uh, or, uh, district in TRA. Uh, and some of you may not know that public educators are still to this day 75% women, of whom a disproportionate number of us are single heads of household. Secondly, we, we surely get old as your, our actuaries have uh, shown. Uh, we, uh, and uh, TRA has 86 educator retirees who are age 100 to 104. 85% um, of us stay in Minnesota. We don't whip out, wimp out and go down south. We live in every one of your districts and we keep your uh, towns and cities thriving. And there's still a number of us that uh, Attorney uh, Rice mentioned who are in the old basic plan and we do not receive our earned social security benefit due to government offsets. So that's a problem uh, that for another day. Uh, but as part of the, the last several pension reform legislative changes, retirees have graciously agreed to be a part of the solution to former funding issues by reducing or eliminating our COLA for a time. Uh, the problem is that there is no way for retirees to ever make up that loss. It's permanent. Uh, in 2021, there are, I'll just, uh, point out three of the many issues that we're following for retirees that we face as uh, that cause us uh, issues in not being uh, uh, challenging what we earn. First of all, did you know that retirees will live eight to 10 years without being able to drive? That scares me. And transportation, convenience, availability, and costs are a challenge and they are expensive, an expense we don't usually predict. A friend of mine literally froze to death in her own garage last winter when she was waiting for the dri a van driver who never showed up. So I feel sorry for the person who's going to try to take my car keys out of my cold, gnarly hand. Uh, secondly, the costs of aging out in our own homes, which we, most of us want to do because we're feisty and independent. Uh, those costs have to be purchased uh, anywhere and paid for and anywhere from uh, snow shoveling, my shoveler just left, and to 24-7 in-home care. It's very expensive, particularly when we don't have um, uh, an increase in our COLA uh, or a nominal one. So when I asked several of my retired colleagues on our one of our many happy hour Zooms about our 1% COLA increase January 1st, they all said, well, they appreciated it, but it was far less than the increase in premiums for our Medicare supplements, our Medicare Part B prescription drug plans, and the current CPI inflation is already projected to be 3.46% by June. So we're losing ground already. So uh, we appreciate 
and we want you to know how much we appreciate the pension principles and we don't believe that there's any alleged fuzziness in the wording of the COLA principle, but uh, the, uh, the amendment is an improvement. The, pens the principles codify the years of work and conversations and results unique to Minnesota, and it's yours and our institutional memory. So uh, retirees, uh, I believe they're understandable and clear, and it makes us uh, very nervous when somebody starts to talk about uh, uh, messing with the principles because we kind of think they're sacrosanct. Just a slight warning. And then um, I'm, I can't figure out uh, what's up with using Wisconsin as a comparison because um, when did we want to become Wisconsin? The only good thing that came out of the public employee pension crisis in Wisconsin were the many K-12 and higher ed profs who moved to Minnesota to come here for jobs when their pensions were cut by 50%. Well, finally, a very few of you, I'm sure, remember the 1989 freight train bill that established a floor of respectability for retirees whose pensions had been eaten away by the double digit infl inflation of the early 80s. My dad happened to be one of those retirees whose pension had to be increased from $3,000 to $11,000 yearly pension that constituted the floor of respectability at that time. So here's our idea, Madam Chair and Commission members. Maybe we can, all together, the 2018 team together again, be smart enough and clever enough to consider and create a ceiling of respectability for retirees. So please continue to consider the realities of our cost of living as we age and try to keep up. And please also know that it's not just tough to get old, it's expensive. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Ms. Sundin. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Vogel, that's me, Council 5, Legislative Director. Welcome. Hi there, uh, Madam Chair. Well, good evening. And Commission members, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Vogel, Legislative Director for AFSCME Council 5. Tonight, I'm testifying on behalf of the Public Employees Pension Coalition, uh, commonly referred to as Pepsi. Many of you uh, are familiar with Pepsi. We've worked together for quite a long time. For the newer members of the LCPR, Pepsi is a group of retiree, uh, labor, and member advocate organizations who monitor uh, public employee pensions in Minnesota. You should have access to the letter we submitted. I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, suffice it to say, our coalition is extensive, if not exhaustive, when it comes to um, public employee pension stakeholders. So first, on behalf of uh, the Pepsi organizations and the tens of thousands of active and retiree members we um, represent, thank you for committing your time and your energy to the pension issues. As Mr. Ray said, uh, over 10% of retired Minnesotans are impacted by your work and they rely on your decisions to achieve a secure retirement with dignity. So again, thank you for your dedication to the LCPR. All of our organizations care deeply about maintaining the purchasing power of the pension benefit throughout the entire life of the retiree, a guiding principle for this commission as has been noted. The short version of what I want to say, Madam Chair, is this. We do not want to see the LCPR relinquish its commitment to that guiding principle. So to that end, thank you for hearing our concerns and renewing your commitment to Minnesota's retirees. The comments we heard at the last commission meeting about eliminating those principles altogether were worrisome for our coalition members to say the least. You know, contribution rates, as has already been pointed out, uh, for current public employees roughly equal or exceed those of public employees from around the country. And one month ago, uh, we heard from SBI Executive Director Perry that the State Board of Investment has been earning phenomenal returns on investments of the contributions from our members. So it's clear to us that the missing leg of the stool to protect our retirees from the consequences of inflation and their benefits from eroding over time is sufficient governmental support. Uh, thank you for your time. 
Uh, we haven't had the opportunity yet to vet the 1A amendment, but it does look like it addresses our concerns. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair and Commission members. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. And we have Mr. Johnson. Representing Thank you. Yep. Municipal Retirement yep. Association. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Dave Johnson and I represent the uh, Minnesota Municipal Retirement Association, which is a group of retirees uh, who are almost all basic plan members, uh, which means that their benefits are not coordinated with Social Security and they do not enjoy COLA, the Social Security COLAs that coordinated plan members receive. I'd like to thank uh, the commission and the staff for the report. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity uh, that they gave us to, uh, to weigh in on a draft of the report uh, and to take public input. Uh, one of the positive things I thought was in the report was the discussion of uh, the impact of COLAs on basic plan members. Um, uh, as the report noted, uh, you know, coordinated plan members get a hedge because they get a CPI based COLA from their Social Security benefit uh, that uh, basic plan members do not receive. Uh, a basic plan member's entire pension uh, for public employment is, is the, uh, in our case, the para general pension. So we appreciate that discussion uh, and agree with that observation. I think our concern about the principles. Uh, and what was in the report had to do with the standard of a COLA. You know, there was a standard in the report, or is, uh, that uh, the purpose of a COLA is to manage the decline of the benefit, as previous testifiers have spoken to. Uh, uh, the principles have a different uh, standard. And I can just say I'm probably dating myself here. Uh, but I started uh, as a young attorney practicing before the commission in 1990. And what I, my observation on the principles that have been updated is it, it's an opportunity for all stakeholders to weigh in and then have a common uh, set of guiding principles uh, that, while not law, uh, do inform the commission and stakeholders as to the, to the policies uh, of the commission and considering pension legislation. Stakeholders feel like they get the opportunity to weigh in uh, and uh, while commission members and, and stakeholders and their representatives change, you know, those principles are there so that there's some conformity and uniformity uh, with respect to the consideration of pension principles and pension policy. So uh, I would, you know, I think it'd be great if the commission should look at that and update it and consider that it's still relevant uh, or not. Uh, I believe they are, but ultimately it's a commission decision. Uh, and uh, my concern, which I think is addressed uh, by both the alternative motion and the A1 amendment was that there was not an inconsistency between adopting the report that had a different standard uh, than what was in the principles. And so, I believe the A1 uh, amendment is an improvement uh, in that regard. Uh, finally, I would just note that uh, even regardless of the standard uh, that over the last decade, there's been a number of uh, pension reforms that have needed to take place to, to uh, make sure that the pension plans remain sustainable. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that MMRA hired an actuary. We hired Aon and they did a full report on those changes. And it turns out that, that about 60% uh, of the cost of those benefits fell on retirees, uh, about 9% on employers and about uh, a third on employees, 9% while they're active, but then another 24% uh, from their retirement benefits. So retirees have borne a significant uh, brunt and they've seen their pensions erode significantly as a result. Uh, I would note, I did submit a couple documents to the commission and I won't go through both of them uh, in the interest of time. But what I would ask you to do is to take a look at this particular document. And what this shows from the actuary is, is, is how much a pair of general members retire since 2010 because of the COLA changes, how much their pension is gonna erode over time. And as Ms. Sundin pointed out, these, these uh, non-perforated lines are already um, 
uh, what retirees lost and have not been able to get back. But as time goes on, the impact is cumulative and the erosion increases. Uh, this, uh, this short dotted line represents the COLA change that happened in 2018, uh, which is, has an inflation component, but it's important to note that, that it's, it's capped at 50% of inflation. So regardless of inflation, it will never keep up. And over time, that discrepancy is gonna grow uh, the, the other chart uh, shows you what uh, uh, the impact is on a basic plan member over time in, in actual dollars that they've lost uh, and uh, how much they stand to lose. So, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time and effort with the actuary and getting that work done. Um, and we hope that as uh, uh, time moves on and we get an opportunity to actually see each other in person, that we can continue the discussion both on the principles uh, and on uh, and on the need for sufficient colas for retirees, uh, especially basic plan members. And with that, uh, thank you uh, for your consideration and I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Members, I got a text from Senator Rosen uh, saying she was gonna step away for a minute and asking me to step in. And with that, we would invite Mr. Moynihan to testify. Mr. Moynihan, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Mr. Co-Chair <laughs> for the opportunity to testify tonight. And uh, my name is Timothy Moynihan for the record. I am a Retired Educators Association, Minnesota Vice President and Legislative Committee Co-Chair. Uh, I begin my message this evening by saying a heartfelt thank Thank you, and I have my hat off uh, to the LCPR staff under the leadership of Susan Limcheski and Chad Burkett for having completed a data-driven evaluation of COLAs and documenting what Minnesota has done to help Minnesota retirees maintain, in your language, the adequate purchasing power with their public pension income. We thank the staff for including us so that our perspective as recipients of the public pensions would be included in this study's report. And I would hope that all of you would look further to see what we have said. From our point of view, retired teachers, the study speaks to the messages that we have heard from our REAM members. We are most pleased with Minnesota's pension funds that are on a predictably positive path towards sustainability, as was mentioned by Mr. Rice, However, the 2018 legislation has made retirees bear the largest burden toward making it so, as was just mentioned by Mr. Johnson. 1% to 1.5% COLAs compounded over time translates to retirees falling further and further behind in their retirement income. The study that's before you today makes this statement, quote, for the statewide plans, other than the Public Employees and Retirement Association Correctional Plan, it is unlikely that post-retirement adjustments will fully recover retirees' loss and purchasing power, and retirees will experience an erosion of the benefits purchasing power, unquote. Reams position has been stated and is part of the COLA study. Our response is more completely stated there and we will not take the time to, for you to have to hear it again now. Our written and oral comments should be instructive as to where we stand. Please know that we feel passionately about pension obligations for our members and likewise about the promises made to actives in our profession. Therein is the compass that guides our, adics, our advocacy. We believe that teachers young and experienced are watching closely what is happening with COLAs. We hear the voices within our profession. There is an impending problem for many, hired after 1989, who will be retiring soon without the benefit of the rule of 90. We have seen the studies that leave no doubt 
the, the recruitment and the retention of teaching professionals is greatly impacted by the promises made and kept by Minnesota's public pensions. Adequate purchasing power is one of those promises. That is why we advocate for active teachers too. We ask that you listen to the words of Dr. Seuss, whose wisdom will never be canceled. Quote, it's not about what is, it's about what it can become, unquote. Minnesota had the wisdom to create the LCPR, to monitor and adjust our state pensions, public pensions. We call upon you to continue that purpose, to celebrate, care for, and sustain those whose life work is public education. Today, we respectfully submit to you that our public pension COLAs are in need of your attention. And we stand ready to work with you on that. Thank you for listening and thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Moynihan. And thank you for celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Look at those. <laughs> That's super. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Ms. Lencheski, could you please review the A1 amendment? Sorry about that. Again, oh, no. if I might, may I uh, turn this over to, to uh, Mr. Burkett? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Mr. Sorry. Burkett. Yeah, no problem. Um, Madam Chair, on page 17 of the report, the A1 amendment would strike a paragraph that reads, we note that as with other statements found in the principles, the statement's precise meaning is ambiguous. Should the post-retirement increase partially or completely offset the impact of economic inflation over time, how, how much value can a benefit lose and still be one that was adequate at the time of retirement? Ultimately, the question of precisely how much protection should be provided as a political one beyond the scope of this report. Uh, therefore, we conclude the purpose of the Minnesota post-retirement adjustment is to mitigate the loss of purchasing power for retirement benefits due to inflation. So that paragraph would be struck from the report. And then um, on page 57, we would strike similar language there and insert the language that's included on, on sorry, insert the language that is currently in the principles, um, which again is, um, we conclude that the retirement benefits should be increased during the period of retirement to offset the impact of economic inflation over time in order to maintain a retirement benefit that was adequate at the time of retirement. Um, and those are the two changes that are, that are made. Um, and Mr. Amendment. Perfect, uh, the changes you would, you would say um, address the, the issues that have been uh, vocalized about the study, adequately address that? Uh, I think so, Madam Chair. I mean, I've heard several issues brought up, but um, the, one of the issues seems to be, um, you know, changing the standard that the LCPR is using when thinking about um, when thinking about what the COLA, the intent of the COLA is. This amendment just makes sure that the status quo remains in place, when, and assuming that the status quo is the principles, and it doesn't uh, make any changes to to what the principles is. And it states what the current principles is as the conclusion for what the purpose of the, the COLA report is, um, or, or sorry, what the purpose of the COLA is under Minnesota law. Thank you. Um, the, uh, questions members for either the testifiers or Mr. Burkick, and then I believe uh, Senator Franz has a motion. Madam Chair, I think Representative Murphy had her hand up. Yeah. I was trying to wave at you. On, on, thank you, Mr. Nelson, Representative Nelson. On page 57, Mr. Burkett, where was that elimination? Where was that amendment on page 57? Representative Murphy, it is um, in the conclusion. Yeah. The first paragraph. All right. You would delete, we conclude that the purpose of Minnesota's post-retirement adjustment is to mitigate the loss of purchasing power of retirement benefits due to inflation. And then from there, insert the 1A amendment. 
I had to look for it too. It was, oh. I still didn't find it. Um, it on page 57 in conclusion, yeah, where it starts conclusion. And the very first paragraph, you go to this the second report, sentence. This yep. report was required to take into account? Well, that would stay. But the next sentence, we conclude that the purpose oh. of sodas, that would be deleted. OK. And then in its place, it would say, we conclude that retirement benefits should be increased during the period of retirement to offset the impact of economic inflation over time in order to maintain a retirement benefit that was adequate at the time of retirement. All right, and then on page 17, it's, we note, um, as with other, the last statement above inflation, uh, yes, the, it would say the, the paragraph that starts, we note that as with other okay. statements found in the principles, that whole that paragraph got would be deleted, right. Okay, I have that then, thank you. Yes, you're welcome, thank you. Uh, Representative Nelson. Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted ahead of, um, yeah, I, I think that more in line with what I believe I mean, the principles are, we, we have the principles, I believe, so that we have a guiding force on us as we, as the membership of the commission changes over. Um, it should help keep us in touch with the in institutional knowledge from the past of why these were created um, and make sure that we, do, we, we follow on the right path and keep these, these plans whole. Um, I know we have in the past when we've had um, issues about funding levels of them, that we got hit hard a couple times in the past two recessions, that we've done some things that have eaten into the, the uh, colas that we were there. I know also in the past, before I was in the legislature in the 90s, there were some large colas that were given out because they were based on the, on the returns of the pensions. And that was probably a mistake back then. But we need to make sure that we keep these plans whole. Um, and I think one thing that Representative Murphy has talked about over the years, at least for the last six, eight years that I've, I've served with her, is that when we set our targets for our, our committees, that we should be setting a target for the pensions and not leave that as a second thought in the, in the, in the, in the hearings, because what ends up is that falls at the bottom and we forget about them. And then at the end, we're having to rush to try and make sure that we keep these pensions whole. So that we, as, a, as, a, as the legislature, are keeping our commitment to make sure that we're putting the money in that needs to be put in because um, if we don't put the money in on time when we should be putting it in, we end up shorting the pensions and that has a long-term cumulative effect on the returns on the pension. So Madam Chair, I think we, if we look at the, uh, the principles, we should look at them, but we still should be keeping them and, and, and looking at them and making sure that we follow these principles as closely as we can, knowing that our times we have to deviate to make sure that we keep we do what we have to do to keep the pensions whole. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Thank you for your institutional knowledge. Uh, thank you for that great work on that pencil behind you <laughs> in the corner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I don't know if you remember my famous uh, saying back in 2018, I had, I had the money squirreled away. Remember that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I just, exactly right. I, I, I've, I've, I've raised that, I've raised that with the speaker when I met with her and I uh, know Representative Murphy when she was the chair of the pension commission, give her credit for that, that she talked about that often that we need to make sure that we set aside that money and squirrel it away that we're not doing the targets out there and forgetting about that these pensions have to be paid for. I totally agree. And then at some point, uh, we will, I don't want to divert too far here, but we will have to talk about the federal funds coming through because I understand there is some money for pensions. I don't know anything beyond that, but um, that information will be coming through. But yeah, very, very good. Thank you, Representative Nelson. And Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Chair, I have been frozen for about the last two minutes on my computer. 
as I have been throughout the evening. And I unfortunately do not know where we are at in the conversation. So I don't know that I can make an informed vote. I can't speak to any of the other house members in the state office building, but I would hope that we would maybe delay this matter until we have better um, connections so that members knew exactly what was happening. Uh, again, I have missed a, quite a bit of the conversation here tonight. Um, Representative Jisco, did you miss the testimony too? Um, I got most of the testimony, but I'm still very confused on what the amendment does and some of the language. Um, and again, it was freezing on some of the testimony, but um, it appears now that I'm in a good spot with being able to hear what we're talking about right now, but I don't know what, what's, what's led up to this and trying to piece the little things I can here together has become very problematic. So I don't know um, what we're talking about, to be honest with you, and it's just a technology issue. Yes. Um, well, we did. I did have Mr. Burgett just go over the 1A amendment, and and then uh, Representative Murphy wanted to we wanted to figure out exactly where that was in the study, um, and then Representative Nelson made some comments about um, reviewing the principles later, um, and about making sure that we have a commitment and we have money. You still can't hear. Yeah, it's freezing up, and I've had that problem um, quite a bit um, at this time of the day in the SOB. That's true. Um, I apologize, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, it is getting to be seven o'clock. And maybe you um, can't. Maybe you can still hear me, but I can. Yes. Okay. I guess what I'd like to know is, um, and maybe I'll just make this as a statement. What I don't want us to see having happen right now, and maybe somebody can tell me if my fears or, or my concerns um, are addressed and how they might be addressed in the uh, uh, amendments um, and what we're looking at. I fear that we have, well, that we could be putting ourselves in a situation where we could be increasing COLAs right now at a very difficult time. Although markets are at high, we do have COVID. I don't know if the markets are um, at record levels given the fact that um, we put a bunch of COVID relief in with, with borrowed money. I am very concerned that we could be revisiting um, falling markets. And you and I both know, Madam Chair, having had to carry um, legislation to try to um, upright and, and the, the uh, state pensions. I do not want to revisit those things um, anytime soon. I want to give our uh, projections a chance to recover before we start talking about um, increasing COLAs at this point to be able to um, really throw off the vesting schedules and um, the solvency that we've been working so hard and so collectively on because we've got a few good years in the markets right now. Mm -hmm. Does the amendment, does the amendment move us to reassure that we can continue moving forward or does it move us back to maybe some past practices that would um, allow us to increase COLAs when we don't know for sure if we have the financial wherewithal within our plans to be able to do that at this time. Great. Very good questions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. You can? <laughs> For how long? I don't know, but I can right now. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Burkett, could you answer this question for Representative O'Driscoll as far as the intent of the 1A? Does that, I'm just reading you know, the, the new language on page 57, it says you should be increased. It doesn't say, say you, you will increase. Um, but can you, can you explain, are we, are we uh, locking ourselves into a mandated COLA increase or, or just basically saying this, if, if it's possible, we should have a, um, a post-retirement adjustment basically. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair and Representative O'Driscoll. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, th there are some differences in the language here. I don't, my personal opinion is that, and I'm not sure this opinion is shared by all the testifiers, um, is, that it, is that the differences are not as, um, they're, they're not very, uh, very pronounced. So I don't think that this language makes a significant change I mean, the, the one thing you can say for this language is that it doesn't change what, what the current statement of the commission is uh, regarding COLAs, which is in the principles. 
Um, otherwise, um, the question is, does it mitigate versus uh, offset? And then in order to maintain retirement benefit that was adequate at the time of retirement is it added on. Um, and that wasn't in the, in, the, in the report as it currently exists. Representative Driscoll, can you hear us? I, I can, Madam Chair. And I guess I have real grave concerns from all the sacrifices that people have made. If our intention is to not lose track that we might do some COLA adjustments in the future, but I don't know if we wanna do those until we're fully funded at 100% or even put language in, because I fear that what will happen as this group takes these positions there will be a conversation that says, well, in our principles, it says, and in our, you know, in our documents, it says we should be doing something to adjust COLAs. I think that's almost too strong a language right now okay. for us to be looking at that in this very critical situation. I equate this to, we had someone who came in to the emergency room, we did emergency surgery, and they're in the critical care unit for about a week, and they've got several months of rehab to go through. We're going to try to get them up and have them get ready for a marathon here that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rice, to that point. Still muted. I'm, oh, yeah, I think I'm getting there. Yeah, you got I, it. I, I, it looks like I can speak. You know what I would say is there's. No, I think that uh, Mr. Burkett described his amendment best. It's a status quo amendment. I think what raised concerns by the pension community is the statement on page 17 and 57 was really a change in your principles. And I might point out over the last decade, you've had these principles for as long as I've been around, yet out of necessity, um, we've had to take COLA cuts, we've had to do increased contributions and everything else. So these principles did not stop the commission from taking the necessary measures in 2010, in 2013, and 2018 to get the pensions right. And as I said, I think this COLA study is a long-term proposition. Um, and I don't foresee us, I've, I've said this to you before, Madam Chair, I think you've got to let the 2018 pension bill sit for probably five years and see how it works and then reevaluate. Um, I'm not aware of any pension legislation this session to increase COLAs. Um, I doubt even next year, there, we are in a turbulent time and don't know what's going on. And I, I, I think our concern was not going backwards with the language that appeared on page uh, 17 and 57 of the, um, of the report. Yes. Okay. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a, again, a fairly nerdy kind of question here, but, you know, words become very important in a document like this. Uh, and so I'm looking at the uh, recommended insert on page 57, where it talks about economic inflation. Uh, and if it said uh, cost of living, I could probably understand it. But is there, a, the, the question is perhaps not for you, Madam Chair, but for the preparer of the amendment, uh, what is economic inflation versus any other kind of inflation? Mm -hmm. is, 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 does, the, does the insertion of the word economic mean anything that I ought to know about before I vote on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this insert makes me pause just a little bit too. Can anybody answer that question? What is economic inflation versus inflation? Who would like to step up? Uh, Madam Chair, I think Ms. Lincheski would like to answer that. Ms. Lincheski. Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator Roser. And Senator, Senator Senjum, um, we have struggled, as I have said, and I said last uh, at the last meeting, with the language in the principles, I cannot answer your specific question. I think this term is a term of art and has a meaning, but you know what we are trying to do here is appease people who feel that the principle here does, does say something to them. 
we, we not only does economic inflation have a meaning that we are not clear about, but there is this language here that says that it's supposed to maintain a retirement benefit that was adequate at time of retirement. And we're not sure that we actually do that kind of evaluation when we're looking at a COLA. We don't sort of say, does this do income replacement at a level that we want? Say, should it be you know, 80% replacing current pay? Should it be 75, 60? I mean, we, we have had so much concern over these principles and trying to understand them that we, we don't even bring them up in our memos uh, for just this reason. And so as much as I think principles would be helpful, we do struggle with these truly. And um, I don't know what economic inflation means, but I think we could find an answer and we could include a definition section in the principles. But right now um, it is not clear. Madam uh, Chair and, and, and Ms. Lincheski, I'm, I'm looking at page 18 of the report and there's, there's a whole there's a whole page on measuring inflation, but again, it's I'm getting into the weeds. I understand that, but uh, there's nothing. There's no. There's no term. Uh, there, there's nothing on that page 18 that talks about uh, economic inflation versus inflation, and that was the nature of my question. That's what we do, Senator Sengem, get in the weeds and pension, right? <laughs> Great questions, um, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I was uh, a couple things. I actually had raised my virtual hand uh, uh, to try and um, uh, just kind of comment briefly uh, on the amendment. It appeared to me what the amendment was intended to do was to remove the inconsistency between the basic standard in the report about managing the decline of the benefit with the principles. Uh, I would also point out that if you look at the principles, uh, there's a second principle which may get to Representative O'Driscoll's concern that the system of periodic post-retirement increases should be funded on an actuarial basis. Uh, and so that's kind of an offsetting principle, you know. So while, uh, you know, uh, 8A speaks to the impact of economic inflation, which I think traditionally has meant a CPI measure similar to uh, a social security measure, at least that's been my experience in my time before the commission. Uh, there is an offsetting principle about the periodic post-retirement increases need to be actuarially sound. And, and so um, uh, I don't see anything in the amendment that would suggest that you're you know, moving into uh, uh, undoing a COLA or doing a COLA as much as it is just removing the inconsistency that I think a number of folks are concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, members, I think we are going to lay this over. It's not quite ready for prime time, I don't believe. And um, I want everybody comfortable with this. If a little more work needs to be done, a few more conversations on the side, we can certainly uh, bring this up again. Um, Ms. Lincheski, what is the, is there any ramifications to not adopting this right now or the session or ongoing what, what what is what's the ramifications sorry senator rosen we have provided this additional um uh, document here which is some alternative motions and at the top of that document we put in the statutory mandate which um, lays out what the commission was being directed to do. Um, and you can see it says, um, this is one of the documents that was attached. Um, it's, I think it's at the bottom of the, um, the COLA uh, report item on the agenda. And it states, the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement shall report its conclusions based on the study during the 2021 legislative session. Um, I don't know how, you know, bound we all feel or the commission feels to this kind of a statement, but that's what we're working with. And that's why we, you know, had suggested that, you know, some kind of motion would be um, a good idea to kind of, you know, cover off this mandate. Um, but that's, um, that's what we're working with here. Okay. 
Well, we'll have to take a vote then at some point. And like I said, this is just kind of a, a stamp of approval. It's not a, it's not the Bible, correct? Yep. Correct. Depends on how it's worded. Mm, Senator, or Representative Murphy. I think, Madam Chair, it depends on how it's worded, what the motion would be, what how it's worded. But I think we need more time. Yeah, I and Representative Murphy, I'm not interested in, in complicating this with a bunch of different departments coming in. I think we can figure this out. We're, we've been around the block a couple of times here. So uh, you get more, <laughs> more cooks in the kitchen and we're gonna have a mess. So I think we'll go ahead and lay this over uh, till next week. And I know Senator Pappas, you had a question you'd like to ask Mr. Anderson, Mr. Doug Anderson, is that correct? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to check in with Mr. Anderson about the backlog on PTSD disability claims to see how that's going and the situation with the evaluators. If he could give us an update. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Pappas, um, we have been making some progress. I have a dashboard that I'll send out to the commission uh, no later than tomorrow morning. Uh, we have been able to reduce the average outstanding uh, evaluation time from two and a half months to slightly over two months. Um, so there has been progress in the, the caseload um, that we're completing. There's a little bit of a slowdown in the applications that are coming in. Uh, so I would say there is some progress, but I'll give you a full update uh, again no later than tomorrow morning. Thank you. Senator Pappas. Yes, Thank you. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up, Senator Pappas. I think maybe perhaps to next week, we just spend a little bit of time talking about this, talking about uh, the work that uh, Ann Finn and her stakeholder group have been doing. I think that's important to kind of round out this entire issue. Um, and um, I, I found it fascinating myself. Um, with that, I, I do want to turn it over to Ms. Lincheski to review the next two meetings. Members, we're going we're gonna to hammer some of this stuff out. So if we could meet next Tuesday, the same time, and Wednesday, if we have to, um, you know, go over or we, or possibly we just run through Tuesday night, just you know, camp out and put some slippers on and have your meal there. <laughs> but we do have a, um, a a quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Some personal bills and Miss Lincheski, um, we have the uh, St. Paul teachers, that's Senator Pappas and Representative Nelson. So we have some, some other, uh, some technical corrections. And then, like I said, we have uh, quite a few personal bills that it would be great to get this done before we go into spring break. And then we'll, um, when we come back, we can adopt the omnibus pension bill. Ms. Lincheski, anything on that? Anything else? Uh, no, that's great. I had also heard um, from, um, I think from uh, your caucus staff that um, Senator Howe's bill on military service um, as well. Um, but then I think, um, I think there was one other having to do perhaps with the MSRS grandfather under the unclassified plan that too um, is one that um, may, may be uh, another item that we uh, that we um, take up um, from what I had heard. So that's that's uh, consistent with what I understand you'd like to, to do. Yes, um, Ms. Lanchester, I think we've got about at least five or six perhaps bills yes. that need um, some attention. And if there is anything uh, members that you see up and coming, please get back to us because we would like to kind of get this uh, all wrapped together next week. And if anybody has, I'm getting a briefing on some of these federal funds tomorrow, we, uh, uh, but I am interested to know what they're gonna be doing for pensions. Ms. Lincheski, do you have any idea on that? Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Rosen, they have included an explicit prohibition on using the federal funds um, to, uh, as a contribution or additional funding for public pension plans. They are providing money in the private sector for these multi-employer plans, okay. um, actually kind of a bailout. And then they are changing rules for the single employer private um, pension plans, but they have been pretty tough as far as allowing any of the funding to go into um, 
public pension funds. So that that is my understanding. I could certainly do the research and provide you with a more thorough kind of um, you know description of what's in that bill. But that's my understanding. I would love that. And of course, you know, knowing the federal government is probably going to change next week. But for right now, <laughs> if you can find out that would be great. Representative uh, Murphy. Madam Chair, if we had a choice between Tuesday and Wednesday night, um, I'd prefer to go along on Tuesday and finish. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that uh, word of uh, preference there. And anybody else that would like to text me or uh, let me know what they prefer, that'd be great. Any other further business that crops up that we need to address? Okay, with that, members, um, the Pension Commission is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.